might it might it might be working, but it's All right, so I think everyone is here. Um, all the advisor design panel members are present. Nigel, are we missing anyone from your team? Nope, our team is all here. I'm just going to try and get my face up here like everybody else. Sorry, one sec. So just for, um, we can start with the administration here. Um, so for the advisor design panel, um, our chair is presenting today. So we'll need a, someone to volunteer to chair the panel today, one of the advisory design panel members. Oh, Tony, we can't hear you. I could always nominate someone. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? <clears throat> so we do need to have a, a chair for the advisor design panel. So and Bob, Ian, or Tony, did one of you want to take on that role? I still can't hear Sorry. you. Was someone trying to volunteer me for a chair? Okay, you'd like to volunteer, Bob? Or? No, I, <laughs> I'm just wondering if someone is trying to volunteer me. My, my uh, sound wasn't working there. But uh, wasn't it Tony did such a good job last time? Well, I, can, I can see Tony speaking, but I can't hear you, Tony. So maybe you want to find a button when you log in. You're, you're not on mute, but we can't hear you. Okay, you can hear me here, but you're, and it's like you're logged in twice. There's a bit of an echo. I can't hear you. If I can fix this. Don't know what's going on. My apologies. Tony, you probably have a background speaker going as well. Um, I think it only works in my office with the headphones. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not a big tech guy. So we have, Tony, we have two images you up on the screen. So maybe I'm going to go out and re enter. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so Tony, you're, you're still in here on one screen. Okay. Can we hear you? Oh, or? I think we can. Tony, can we can you hear us? I can, can hear you, Sarah. Okay, okay, so it's working now. We can hear you, and I, uh, I can't see you. <laughs> Something is. Uh, just hang on. Let's see. Now I've got you. Okay. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry about all that. I don't know what happened. I think I had the application open twice, and I couldn't find one of them. So. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll uh, chair the meeting <laughs> after all that. <laughs> great, thank you, Tony. So um, I guess a call to order uh, here. Um, this is a meeting to, uh, to review 187 and 193 Bagshaw Street. Um, 
we should kick off with an adoption of the minutes from May. And uh, I assume everybody has had a chance to review those. So um, if there's no objections. Could somebody move to have those minutes adopted, please? I can do that. I'll move. And a seconder. Anyone? Ivan? Ian. Do I have a seconder? Did somebody record that? Yeah, yes, we got it. Thank you. All right. So um, let's commence the, uh, the review and start the presentation. Um, and uh, Len, are you going to lead that? Yes, I will. OK, then uh, please start. OK. All right, thanks everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be presenting this uh, project today. Um, you'll notice we have a representative of the uh, development team, Bill, who's joined us today. So thank you, Bill and Dana, for uh, joining us. Um, I'm sure if there are any questions directly related to um, uh, to you, the developer, then um, you you will we'll have an opportunity later on to uh, to kind of um have those questions answered by you um we also have cara mcdonald who's our landscape architect and nigel who is our um, has been our consultant through the um the development permit application and um, i have claire with me uh, from dhk architect so um this uh, i'm going to keep uh, i'll keep the presentation short because i think our video is a little glitchy and uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll just rely on uh, questions and answers as opposed to me rambling on forever. So uh, uh, the subject property is located in the downtown commercial C3 zone. Um, uh, Bagshaw Mixed Use Development is located at 187-193 Bagshaw Street. The property is situated within beside uh, Thrifty's Foods to the north and residential neighborhoods to the south. Uh, forgive me in advance if I don't look at you, it's just my uh, my presentation screen is on uh, on another monitor, and I'm going to share that screen with you guys right now, if that's okay. Okay. So I think everyone should be seeing our screen, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, yeah. Uh, as you can see here, this is a parking lot for the rear side of Thirsty's at Bagshaw. And uh, we have uh, residential neighborhoods to the uh, uh, to the rear of the property on the other side of the uh, the greenway. Um, I'll just jump to the next slide here. So the subject property, as I said, is within the C3 zone uh, with single family, medium density and high density zones to the south, east and southwest. Uh, the, down, the downtown commercial property is separated from the residential zones by the green um, evergreen right of way and a Jensen right of way. So that is this is our subject site on the screen here. This is a this is the Jensen um, right of way and this is the evergreen right of way. So we have a green buffer existing on those two sides with Thrifties uh, in front of us and Bagshaw on uh, one side with residential neighborhoods surrounding us. Um, so as per the C3 zone, the plaza, uh, we have a plaza level, which will um, provide space for pedestrian oriented commercial retail spaces that meet the various product and servicing requirements of the community. The project also responds to the desired principles of the development permit area, which stipulates the need for commercial and mixed use um, on this particular piece of property. The, um, you'll notice that we're um, adjacent to the C3 zone this is Thrifties, and then we have the residential zones um, on the flanking us on the south and uh, east. So this is our this is our property location. Um, some of the uh, or the development permit area um, conditions that we are trying to respond to is um, obviously height, preserving existing views, emphasis to frontages with respect to our street address, our front entry to residential and uh, to the commercial spaces. Uh, we wanted to orientate the building in a manner that was respectful of the site uh, and then provide exterior finishes and colors that are appropriate within the uh, this development permit area and also respect the West Coast nature of our 
general location. And then um, we also needed to uh, uh, respond with uh, stormwater management, uh, which uh, Cara can speak to a little bit later on. And, uh, and then obviously incorporate the off street parking and uh, integrate accessibility features as best we could and uh, incorporate some of the uh, environmental and sustainability features as well. So if I'll just slide through some of the rest of the boring stuff. Um, the proposed site coverage is 67% of the site um, as opposed to the 100% which is allowable. Our, our floor area is proposed at 1.59 FAR. Uh, the allowable is 2.0. Our, our principal building height is 19.82 and the allowable height is 11 meters. So there is a, um, a variance that we are requesting. Uh, we can talk about that later on in the uh, slideshow. Um, you'll also notice our off street parking. We have um, included additional parking for this particular piece based on the um, the nature of trying to make the commercial space as accessible and as um, um, convenient as possible. And then obviously um, providing a little bit more parking for the residential units up above. Um, so our, uh, just a quick view around the, uh, the site. Uh, you'll see our key plan here with a couple of vignettes. So um, image number one, is our primary street address from uh, off of Bagshaw. So we have our primary driveway entry adjacent to the parking area of Thrifties, which is screened with landscaping and fencing. Uh, we have a ground floor commercial space that addresses the street at the ground level, at the pedestrian level. We have um, overhead covered, uh, uh, covered walkways uh, leading to the primary entry for the residential unit and then the rest of the commercial further down this way. So our, our building is sort of L-shaped on the site. Uh, we kind of held the building back as far as we could from Thrifties uh, in order to try and create that uh, voluminous space and uh, daylight between the back of the Thrifties store and the front face of our residential units that are actually facing out towards the water view. Uh, this second image illustrates the interface between the, uh, the uh, Jensen walkway uh, green space. Uh, so we have this green corridor that we wanted to address the buildings. We've uh, orientated the uh, residential overlooking that. So there's lots of eyes and in, into the community, into the public park and green space. Uh, this uh, third slide shows the uh, connection between the evergreen and Jensen walkways and how our building again kind of turns the corner has lots of uh, street address and eyes looking over the uh, public walkways that connect through to Thrifties and out to Bike Shop. Uh, the fourth slide, oh, sorry. The fourth slide on its bottom uh, shows the, the edge of our parking garage, which has this uh, interesting uh, perforated metal screen uh, with, uh, with a sort of a, a, a decorative uh, appeal to it that screens the uh, driveway into the parking along with landscape buffers and, uh, and fencing as you can see in the slide. So that's basically a pictorial around the site. You can see from the, the site plan, this is our entryway. Our primary entry into the residential is situated here close to Bagshaw. Then we have a uh, commercial space that faces out with primary entryways off of Bagshaw and also off of the parking area. We've got some bench seating and then we have this um, uh, below residential parking zone. And then the second commercial space in the, uh, the southwest corner with uh, patios that overlook the green space. Um, potentially we're hoping we can get a nice uh, restaurant or coffee shop or something interesting into, into that space. But uh, that's basically the overview of, um, of that. This is, so at level one, we have, um, uh, like I mentioned, all of the commercial space. So again, vignette number one is standing at the primary entry. We're looking at the commercial space that fronts the uh, front bag shaw. Uh, the second slide illustrates how we've uh, increased the depth of the overhead canopy for the to um, uh, provide a, a sort of a prominence to the residential entry. The materiality has changed. We have uh, 
stone cladding and uh, another uh, you know glass expanses to uh, exemplify the uh, residential entry and then on the third slide underneath the building is the uh, the entry to the commercial space at the back of the site you'll notice we have a um, a wood look soffit um, hanging over the whole covered parking area so there's direct pedestrian connection from Bagshaw all the way through the site, navigating across the residential entryway, across the front of the commercial spaces into the rear of the site. Uh, that is all covered and uh, downlit. So uh, we've kind of concentrated heavily on wayfinding and identifying the significant areas within the, uh, within the property. Uh, if we just illustrate some of the floor plans to give you a sense of the rationale for the building. Uh, we come down into uh, a parking garage. So this is a completely below grade uh, parking garage where we have um, uh, uh, excess parking, uh, mechanical, electrical spaces. We have storage areas, lockers, amenities, um, other wash bay amenities uh, for residences of the, of the building above. Um, on the next slide, just real quick, this is, uh, so jumping up over level one, which is the commercial space, uh, level two is the first level of the residential units. You'll notice the, uh, the articulated entryway, covered entryway for the primary entry into the three floors of residential above commercial level. Um, this is further exemplified by breaking the form of the roof lines, exposing the, uh, the stair and elevator well so that there is uh, there's animation and activity present on the uh, on the street side or on the parking side of the of the building, and also to kind of break up the mass and create that interesting form between front building and uh, rear building. Uh, where we can, we have um, we've located a couple of small green roof areas that would be contributors to the overall stormwater management system. Um, so we're hoping to be able to take advantage of the covered area over the entryway, which is also the garbage enclosure, and also a little bit of a green space over the primary entry at level one, so that on level two, three, and four, when you're waiting for your elevator, you can look down over the, uh, the green roof. Uh, level three gives you an example of um, the range of, of units. We have larger units on the end with smaller units on the uh, uh, along the middle, we have five one bedrooms and eight two bedroom units per floor. Um, this vignette also gives you an idea of how we've crafted the form of the building to address Bankshaw at the commercial level. We've created this kind of um, uh, orientated mass roof plane that turns down to create a, um, a building that feels like it's fronting onto Bankshaw. And then we have um, a, a secondary articulated roof line that uh, captures the three floors of residential that overlook the green space. Um, and then if we keep flipping up through the plans, uh, this, is, uh, this is level four. So at this level, the uh, end units, these two and these three, they have um, stair internal staircases, which provide access up onto private roof gardens. Uh, this view again shows how we've articulated the forms as we as we turn around the building, and each corner of the building responds to its um, its kind of immediate context. Um, we've got some screening and landscaping at the rear of the building along the evergreen. Uh, walkway and then we have balconies and decks for the larger units and you'll see the little peekaboo uh, rooftop terrace staircases here. So that's kind of the three stories of uh, a range of different unit types uh, ranging in sizes and number of bedrooms and then when we get up to the rooftop uh, a couple of the vignettes at the bottom here illustrate the private rooftop terraces that have uh, little planter boxes on them and some privacy screening and then the majority or uh, we're hoping all of the mechanical equipment would be screened in, in behind a louvered mechanical um, chaseway uh, centered in the building to minimize its, uh, its impact on the overall look and feel of the building. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, materiality, 
Uh, we've got a, our uh, materials palette, which I'm sure you've kind of seen in the package, but essentially it's a collection of relatively muted West Coast feel materials where we're using um, low maintenance uh, wood look uh, metal siding mixed with a, um, a sort of a texture, very heavily textured uh, cultured stone, which still feels quite modern and, um, and contemporary, but, uh, but um, creates that, that nice contrast between the smoothness of the, of the wood look metal. And then we have uh, various gray uh, siding as the, the main body of the building in a hardy panel and so on. So we've got glass guardrails, we have um, screens on the south and west side that are these perforated screen materials that provide some passive solar shading. And, uh, and then we have glass guardrails to, uh, to create a little bit of privacy between the private and the public realm. Uh, where we have other soffits, we've got a, a gray muted vinyl soffit and some, uh, some storefront glazing that would be for the commercial spaces. So that's a real quick uh, cast through the, the materials. Um, uh, hopefully that kind of relates out onto the, uh, the general form and character. You can see where our uh, wood textures accent areas of entry and other materials accent the massing of the building. Um, the elevations obviously kind of speak for themselves. There's lots of information there that I would rather answer questions than wade through all of it. But um, uh, we're, we're really excited about the form of the building, the opportunity to create this uh, covered year-round um, space that um, allows people to park their cars, get into the commercial spaces. Uh, I, and I'll also note that on the ground level where the primary entry to the residential is, is also a uh, amenity rooms for fitness and space for um, cart storage and various other storage, uh, bicycle storage, so that um, people don't necessarily have to um, drag their bicycles up into, the, uh, into their apartments that amenity is captured on the ground level. Um, uh, the other elevations in the same thing, you can see how our commercial spaces kind of are glassy and open. Our uh, garbage area is concealed and uh, the parking is screened and below grade with uh, uh, a decent amount of parking at um, plaza level in order to kind of make the uh, commercial spaces as accessible as possible. Um, this um, picture just illustrates the requested variance for height that we are after. So um, I believe it's an 8.82 meter variance that would include uh, up to the, the flat roof, but also inclusive of the additional uh, penthouse staircase out onto the rooftop deck. So we, um, we just included that right to the max height of the, of the building. Um, so I'll let I'll just let Cara go through some of the landscape features, and then we'll finish off with uh, a little bit of a talk about the lighting concept, and then we'll just open it up to questions and uh, anything else that we can further describe the project for you. Cara, hi. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, I have a brief presenta presentation that'll go over some of the development permit area guidelines. So. Uh, to start off with, the planting plan focuses on screening the off-street parking from the neighboring commercial property to the north, Bagshaw Street to the east, uh, the Jensen Avenue right-of-way to the south uh, that is currently used as a public trail, and um, yes, sorry, period. Uh, the Bagshaw off-street parking is screened with a coniferous U hedge um, out in the front. The neighboring commercial to the north and the trail to the south are screened with a combination of a four foot metal picket fence and tall shrub planting. We have shown a conceptual detail for the metal picket fencing on our sheet L2. Um, landscape screening in the form of a two meter high solid wood fence and tree planting is provided along the Evergreen Street right of way, which is also um, used as a public trail. Uh, there's also a residential adjacency across the right of way on the other side. There are two marked pedestrian crossings in the parking areas, one at, uh, in front of the drive, right, yeah, thank you, Lacan, for <laughs> pointing. Better you're controlling it, because I totally blew it the last time I presented. <laughs> um, and then right, another, another one in front of the ramp down to the park parking area. 
Um, the pedestrian walkways throughout the site um, provide connections between parking and the buildings. The interior walkways are intended to be level with the driveway and provide barrier-free direct access to building entries and all accesses I think exceed, but are a minimum of 1.2 meters wide. Uh, so as a wayfind advice, the decorative finishes and textures will, of the paving will identify pedestrian zones and facilitate ease of navigation uh, to the main entries. The decorative paving will also act as a tactile device along pedestrian routes to differentiate between drive aisles and to enhance cognitive wayfinding and improve safety for accessibility purposes. The um, raised as well as surface planters are interspersed within the pedestrian hardscapes. There's um, a couple of raised planters out in front of the residential building, the residential building and also um, in front of this the commercial space to the west. Um, there are oh, site also site furnishings. We also included, sorry, benches in front of the residential, the entrance to the residential suites and then, and bike racks. Um, and there's also benches and bike racks associated with the CRU, the commercial space on the ground floor as well. Um, uh, overall, the site uh, uses a mix of uh, native and non-native drought tolerant plant species. Uh, there wasn't sufficient space, space to provide shade trees along the zero lot line on the south property line, but we have provided shade trees along the north property line adjacent to Thrifties, um, and as well as the west on um, Evergreen in front of the CRU windows. The um, obviously a substantial portion of the site obviously is going to be shaded by the building um, from where it is located and then also just literally it's covering um, parking. So we're mitigating um, heat, heat island effect that way as well. Um, the, we have proposed, I'll just briefly talk about the lighting that's in the landscape. So the, we have provided three ornamental full cutoff flat lens LED parking lot lights on the north side um, of the uncovered parking areas. Um, the, oh, sorry, as part of the integrated stormwater management, the landscaping will include uh, 400 millimeters of absorbent soils in all soft landscape areas. The, um, there's green roof systems on the low roof above the residential main entrance as Glenn alluded to as well as above the um, garbage enclosure. The, the, I'll just speak to it, the civil engineer isn't here, but there will be uh, an engineered underground deten detention facility uh, provided on the site as well to deal with um, peak storm runoff. And the green roof systems, uh, in addition to contributing to stormwater management will also be effective in the reduction of CO2 and contribute to the reduction of GHG emissions. And I think that covers it for now. Back to you, Glenn. Um, so we'll just um, skip to this slide that briefly just illustrates the, um, we had some um, correspondence and feedback from the planning department as we were going through this regarding lighting. So we have created a, uh, a lighting scheme that is specifically about creating uh, downlight and protecting the night sky. So here is a, a sort of a, a list of the types of lighting that we'll be using. We're, we're defining parking by the linear strip lights. We're uh, downlighting the pedestrian walkway so that uh, our lighting system not only kind of minimizes impact um, around the, the neighbor the neighboring um, context but also provides a bit of a wayfinding um, between pedestrian areas and vehicular areas as well um, so i think i will leave it at, at that this is just a sort of an illustration of our uh, overview of landscape integrated into the architectural master plan all of the facilities at ground floor for the residential component above and in the commercial spaces and an overview of our form and character. So if, um, if you guys have any questions or if there's anything we missed, um, oh, I will men just mention that uh, we, we are planning to have the entire building uh, solar ready so that um, uh, there will be conduit and um, um, access available to uh, to install solar whenever that becomes a, um, 
um, sort of at the appropriate time. So we can uh, we can also include that as part of our uh, part of our uh, attempt to uh, um, set the building up for uh, future proofing against uh, alternative energies. Can I just add a note on um, some of the civil components? If you don't mind, Glenn. Yeah, no, yeah sure. Do you want me to um, go back to the uh, slide plan? No, I, I think I'll just, just words. I just wanted to mention that uh, Kara did note that there's an underground detention facility required for this project, and uh, that's due to the downstream capacity of the pipes. So this project, unlike many others, will actually meet pre-development flows completely. So it's, uh, it's going to be a little bit more advanced integrated stormwater management approach. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was just that there are EV stations in the underground parking lot provided as a component of this development as well. And those are the only two points I had. So back to you, Glenn, and the design team. Thanks. Thanks, Nigel. So, yeah, thanks for your time. Um, uh, we welcome any questions and uh, any clarification that we can we can offer before, uh, before we start getting into it. Okay, well, this would be uh, the panel's uh, opportunity for questions, comments, and some discussion. Um, so I guess we'll kind of go around the table and do that uh, one at a time. So would anybody volunteer to go first before I point you? <laughs> yeah, I can. I have a couple of questions. Okay. So on the first question, you mentioned the uh, EV parking. What percentage is that of the total parking? I think uh, it looked just, like about eight units, I think. Yeah, let me just go to the parking. There we go. Uh, I think uh, six to 24 is, so that's from here. From this point all the way across to the end of this drive aisle are going to be assigned electrical vehicle ready stalls. And, and as you see, when you say EV ready, does that mean fully wired? They can just drive in and plug in? I believe um, someone with a, whichever, whatever vehicle they have would need to uh, install their own charger, but I believe, um, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but the intention is to have it uh, wired and ready to receive a charger so that someone can um, plug in their, uh, their Tesla charger or their Chevy charger, whatever it is, and have par at that site ready or at that parking stall ready to go. That, that, that's correct. They'll be running off their own set of meters and it'll be ready for, say, a, a pre-sale. Somebody comes in and says we have a Chevy Volt, then they can, uh, as part of their package, will include that charger. But unfortunately, most of these cars all use different plugins and stuff. So we're going to have it all wired, ready to go. And depending on who buys what unit or in the future, somebody who wants to upgrade to an electric vehicle, they have that option. And I think we chose about 30, th a third of the stalls for for ownership for ev charging okay thank you uh second question the retention i call it a pond but i'm guessing it's a concrete chamber is it that's correct it'll be an underground chamber of some type to be determined by our civil engineer okay but yeah it is an absolute requirement on this one fully lined and usual correct stuff. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Controlled uh, outlet orifice and, and all of that to delay the time of concentration into the storm pipes. Okay. And my last question, uh, are there any existing residential units close that the uh, shadows, if you've done any vision, sight lines or shadow lines that cross over onto existing residential? Uh, we haven't done a specific shadow study. Um, however, our stack massing, uh, if I just go up here, so on the, let me just give you a third plan. So the, the majority of the massing of the building is against the, this walkway. So um, there, there's a significant gap. It's almost like a full lot width mm -hmm. gap between our, our four story building and the, uh, the residential uh, community to the uh, direct South. So early morning sun coming up, um, we would uh, we would imagine there would be sort of, you know, maybe in the in the wintertime, there might be some overshadowing, but the um, the and then in the in the afternoon, as the sun comes around to the south, um, it would basically be overshadowing all of the parking of Thrifty's and our building as well. So 
Um, the intention was to try and stack our building up against the, you know, the nice walkway that's going to be maintained and preserved and, uh, and create that and, and utilize, take advantage of that significant buffer between the single family residential and, uh, or sorry, the multi single floor residential and the, uh, and our multi building. Okay, thank you. That, that's all the questions I have. And uh, no other comments or? Uh, I, have, uh, I would like sorry. to a few questions. I, I meant from Bob, sorry. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, that was you, Ivan? No, Ian. Ian, sorry, uh, it's only so many of you across the top of my screen, so I have to look for who's talking. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Okay, I'll go. Um, I was wondering why the why there could be a little bit more emphasis for the front entry um, of the residential, because uh, as you drive in, there's some opportunities to actually signify a lot clearer where the entrance to the entire building is. And I know you've got a stone wall with a label on it, but um, that whole block, if there was something that could either increase the canopy or uh, change the material on the canopy to identify that this is the main entrance. I, I find that uh, in such a complex kind of building with one commercial space, a residential space and a restaurant all vying for attention. Um, I'm just wondering whether we could have done something a little bit more to mark the entryway. Um, so that's one comment. Uh, a couple of other things. What, what, what was the actual thinking of putting the restaurant at the back of the building as opposed to the front of the building? We have a commercial office near the street entry and the restaurant at the back. Is there any outdoor space for the restaurant? And should the restaurant be at the back? And I'm yeah, not, sure who the, not sure who the restaurant is for, whether it's for the public or... I think we lost you, Ian. I think we lost Ian for a second there. Okay. Uh, he'll come back on here, I'm sure. Yeah, he's, uh, he's missing. There he is. Ian, we lost you for about 15 seconds there. Sorry. Can you... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my phone was ringing. That's why. Okay. So I guess the question was the, the restaurant at the back, whether it had outside seating and... Uh... Well, what, what was the actual uh, intention of putting that kind of public facility tucked deep into the site, as opposed to having it at the front of the building? Because you have an office at the front and a restaurant at the back. Um, what, who is the restaurant intended for? And is there a way to... You know, maybe just 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 explain the rationale about the location. Sure. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. Um, well, first of all, we're we're not entirely sure whether or not. Um, I mean, ultimately, it's going to be it's a commercial re retail space. So, um, you know, I'm not quite sure who is going to occupy it. But uh, we, when we were sort of thinking about it. Uh, we really like the idea of a, um, a little brew pub or a, or a restaurant. And the idea was that it was actually um, tucked in. This zone here is all exterior patio space that is connected to the pedestrian walkway on the side. So rather than, you know, having the restaurant here, um, we, uh, we, we sort of relied on the fact that there was, um, it was, there was convenience to a back of house that would service potentially a kitchen. Um, there's space in there that would allow for uh, back of house use, such as the you know the the storage and the um, and then the back of house kitchen stuff that would be 
nestled back in here. And then this would sort of glass up and be a kind of an interesting interconnection between uh, restaurant space, patio outside dining space, and then right across the, um, in this covered area, on the other side is the amenity space for the residential. So we just thought that it would be interesting to create a uh, sort of a lively, relatively constantly animated space that was uh, reflecting onto the pedestrian zone as opposed to relying 100% on Bagshaw, which, you know, may or may not receive a lot of pedestrian traffic, but um, our thought was to create something that was fresh and new for the pedestrian walkways and the greenways that are on the south and the east to, to try and uh, load them up with a bit more animation as opposed to it just being a, you know, pedestrian walkway getting you from one one side of town to another. So um, this, this uh, space would certainly lend itself to the practicality of a restaurant based on its proximity to back of house loading spaces, um, deliveries coming and going, whereas the front uh, space could lend itself, you know, we thought slightly more appropriately to a commercial retail space that would actually have sort of uh, that street presence. So um, obviously a subjective topic, but that was our, that was our general rationale for, uh, for that. Well, it's, it's, it's just that I, I know the issues and problems of restaurants um, when it comes to servicing in terms of loading and deliveries, it can create quite a, a problem. Um, so it's, it's where do you put that problem at the front of the building, where you can have tree, uh, trucks parked to deliver produce every day, or do you tuck all of that inside the site? So those are issues. And if you're talking about relating it to the public walkways, um, there's an opportunity, obviously, to connect the site to the walkway, you know, across the green space. Um, but of course, we don't see any of that here at this point. And I would, you know, if I had my way, I would, I would get away with, I mean, dispose of the parking area in between the residential entrance and the restaurant so that we don't uh, treat, you know, we don't break up the really nice space that you've created under the building with parking. Um, I still think that that's, that's a very valuable space and a very valuable outdoor amenity area and to devote it to Four, four car spaces, I think, is is kind of uh, wasteful or misguided in terms of putting cars instead of people. So I, I, I would question the use of those four car spaces in between and whether you can get away with a reduction in the parking. Um, I think it would be much more valuable to the whole project. But um, I'm also concerned about the front entry as well. So maybe we can just talk about those two items. Sure. No, I I, uh, I understand. We um, we have created uh, some identifiers that um, change the look and feel of the front entry, but um, um, I think what I'm hearing is that the definition isn't uh, strong enough, in your opinion. Ian, are you there? I yeah. My my phone keeps ringing. I need to switch it off or something. Hopefully, we'll be past this technology in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know why it's interfering with any of this stuff, but uh, I'll just turn it off. Okay. Um, yeah. I, Uh, you know, you, you've used some wood um, on, on that particular view, so the wood look for the aluminum uh, um, siding, and it's a pity there isn't any more of it. Um, I think it's a very nice color and, and feel, you know, in terms of people. So some of that around the entryway could have helped, I think, a little bit more, and the fact that the canopy would have been nice if the canopy was even larger, you know, um, to actually signify that 
this is the entry and you're safe and this is where you should head to when you're driving in or when you're walking to the site. Uh, a change we have uh, the, the entire the entire soffit of level one is, yes. is all going to be clad in that wood look material. So yeah. the idea was um, at level one, the commercial uh, landscape ceiling that you engage under is uh, is the wood is all wood look uh, material with uh, integrated lighting. And then when you step back from the building, uh, the top roof line is again the entire thing is the wood look uh, soffit profile, which then turns vertically down at various areas where the massing of the building gets interrupted. So we wanted to we wanted to kind of be strategic with where we were using the wood. And uh, we chose the horizontal planes as the strong emphasis on that material. And then the, the three story, the soffits for level two and three would be yeah. uh, toned down to the, to the gray tone. So allowing us to kind of take advantage of the material at the, at the roof plane and at the uh, human scale at the level one um, commercial. Yeah. I, I, I can see that um, and I appreciate that, you know, effort on those horizontal areas. But if you look at picture one on the bottom of your, your slide, um, no, 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 on, on the, the picture, yeah. Um, if, you, if you're driving in or walking into the site, if you're walking, you might be on the, on the, on the walkway, but if you're driving in, um, there's no way of really knowing where you're going. That's, that's in a nutshell, you know. Well, well, I'm hoping that by that time, which is not showing right now as the owner, that there will be a sign that it'll have the name and maybe the residence. Yeah. Um, the, the whole thing was to try and keep the building subtle looking with nothing really overbuilt yeah. compared to the rest of the building. Yeah. And, um, you know, as far as the parking goes from our previous projects, we found if you don't have places to park, you don't get people into the commercial spaces. They're just, right. it, it, there is no real bag shop parking. It's already a very busy street. Thrifty's parking lot is overflowing. Um, so for my, my, my object with, with, with Glenn was that we need to have at least twice the required parking yeah. because it, say the restaurant space becomes a medical space and not a, a, a restaurant because it's all open discussion you you need to have the parking available for people and some of that parking that's near that area might be limited to people that have, don't have the access that can't walk the distance that need to be yeah. closer to the entries of the buildings because from our previous projects in town a space size which the cru's are larger they're not all chopped into 1,000 square foot units because you only need so many in Parksville. You need some bigger uh, retail spaces in order to for people to, to come in. And right. B, if you don't have these parking spaces, which uh, I was involved in a project in Parkville just recently, and we've lost sales of the commercial space and leases because they didn't find the approved parking was adequate enough to service their clientele that they would constantly be driving in circles around the around the property looking for a place to park so that was our main concern with the parking is to, is to make sure that it was adequate because unfortunately mo a lot of people in parks will still drive in they just don't walk to yeah. walk that site so that was our biggest concern with the parking and and as far as the entryway my my idea to glenn under under my direction was to keep it as subtle as we could and that signage would locate the the beautiful storefront and if people are walking underneath as you can see they have an address on that number two picture, but it'll be, you know, that's just for this draft. It'll, it'll end up having a nice sign on the front of the fascia yeah. um, tented for, and lighting as well. That's different than the linear parking lighting that will accent that whole area. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't want to belabor it, but I just think it's a real pity to have such a nice courtyard and to put four cars in it. Um, that's the, the bottom line of my comment, because you've gone through great pains and it's a very valuable space. It's valuable for the commercial as well as the, the office space. And I think it's such a pity, that's all. I mean, I think you can keep the, the, uh, the uh, handicapped space, yeah. but those other four spaces, I think it just destroys that space completely. But that's just, you know, my quick uh, <laughs> view of what, is going on there. Anyway, I'll uh, 
I'll yeah, let okay. somebody ask some more questions right now. Okay, I think Ivan, you're next. I've got a couple of questions off the bat here. The, the property immediately to the south, what, what is that building? This one? Yeah, that one there. It's a uh, um, single, uh, it's a residential um, multi, multi building. So it's single, like patio, patio style homes. Um, and it, it, I think it's across the road. Anyway, was, that's the walkway. So yeah. this is the green space, and that's their eight or nine foot hedge, and that's the roof of the single story uh, residential. And, and then on the, the property on the west side, uh, that's forested. Yep. Yes. Is private property. It's not. It's not a reserve. Right? I believe private there's property. a couple of. Yeah. yeah. It's two two separate private properties there, Ivan. So those trees will be gone too at some point when that's developed. Um, don't know. But, okay. Anyway, um, I. I like the, the overall concept of the building that, uh, and uh, as Ian said, uh, the uh, space between there's a nice openness that uh, made the building feel quite light at, at uh, ground level. I, I also wondered about the parking and servicing the restaurant in the back, but that's something the owners will have to deal with. Um, but I think the main, problem we have here is the height variance, which no one has talked about yet, which I think is, Not yet. <laughs> uh, which is a significant uh, variance. And in principle, I don't have a problem with it because I think everything that is going to be developed in that area will probably need a variance to be viable down there. The only thing I find uh, about the roof, the, uh, the roof decks, I think, are a bad idea. I think that uh, you should lose the roof decks if you can, because they're, uh, I think they're, they can be dangerous. People can get out of those areas and walk around on the roof. Uh, I know people can do all kinds of stupid things, but I think there's a potential there for some danger. And I think that would make your uh, your height variance more palatable if you if you got rid of that, and if you talk about future use of uh, solar uh, solar arrays up there, they would be in conflict with what you have up there right now. So it's one or the other. You're either going to have solar in the future, or you're going to have these decks up there, and. I think also those units on the top floor all have very large balconies. In fact, they've been very generous with balconies in all the units. Uh, but if you lost the, uh, the stairs in those units, you could make them even bigger and would be even less reason to have the, uh, the roof decks. And I'm sure that from, from that floor, they already have a fantastic view of uh, Parksville Bay. Am I correct there? Yeah, I yeah. imagine there would probably be reasonably, would be up above thrifties at that point. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they're above thrifties. It's, uh, but um, so with the, um, oh yes, I, before I move into the landscaping, you know, I've got a few questions of that. Um, check. Okay, so if we can just go on to the landscaping here. <clears throat> so on the, on the west side and the north side, there's a fence. 
that I can see absolutely no purpose for them because there's no access to that area. And I think that if you, if you lost that fence, it would really soften the whole appearance of the building next to the walkway. If I, if I may respond to that, um, Bill, the client, and Bill can probably speak to this um, more. Uh, from experience, he's just having just completed a new building. He has had nothing but problems with um, people that are not you that don't live there or are not using a site uh using the site staying there cutting through loitering i don't even know what so uh the fencing is in is for is for more of a security control of access but bill can probably speak to that a little bit more yeah so there's no access to that, and there's no openings on that on the west side. There's I can't see why it would make that much difference. So you know, I mean, you can do whatever you like, but I'm just saying that it seems like a redundant fence that makes the appearance uh, much harder from from the the walkway. My my other. Uh, question is with the you know you've got this fantastic right of way that that uh, you you can connect to I, I would assume and yet you've blocked it off and it's um, I think that's a lost opportunity there that you could make that that uh, open space much more exciting if you had access through there instead of blocking it off Um, those are my main, uh, my main points that I'm concerned about there. Otherwise, I think, uh, uh, it's a very, uh, very pleasant building and, uh, but, um, uh, got, got a few issues that I, I think would, I would change. Thank you. I wonder. Bill, I don't know. Again, I I think you can probably talk to the frustration you've had with um, with yeah, on, people on accessing that. your sites, but um, the city may be amenable to to providing a connection to the trail to the south from the from the restaurant. Well, if it's a restaurant, but from that patio, I'm not sure how you so, feel about that. So Bill. One of the big things, and like you and I discussed, Kara, was because we're putting trees on that west side along along that you know, the CRU side there, as soon as it seems you get trees and hedges involved, you get people sleeping, camping out, loitering. Uh, one of the projects, we now have somebody daily going around picking up needles, syringes, garbage, um, and, and it actually debeautifies it, at least uh, some separation with that gate access at the underground parkade side for, for managerial or, or, or landscaping people to go in and work. Is, is, it's unfortunately something in this day and time we have to do. Um, every time you leave something open, you seem like you're on a weekly basis of fixing something, cleaning something, redoing something. We had a one, one spot, somebody was ripping a bush up and stuffing their drugs underneath it and coming back at night to get them until we caught them. So, you know, I, I know it's not that I would love to leave everything open and put picnic tables out for walk passerbys to use. But unfortunately, like at Dogwood, the back picnic table now is not being used by anybody because we've had to kick people out of there that didn't belong on the property. And we've just roped it off now for a while, see what happens. So that's the unfortunate part. I do agree, open would be better, but unfortunately in this day and world, we don't seem to be able to do it. So, and as the owner, I'm trying to take precautions for my residences as, as well, that you know that the person on the second floor looking down isn't dealing with, with somebody doing you know criminal activities or whatever else they do in those areas. Well, I guess it's a, for a sign of the times, but that's yeah. It is. The, one other thing is also the green roofs. I find uh, the one over the the entrance to the apartments. I, I, it's it's so secluded and on the north side. I wonder what would grow in there. Uh, I have a, we'll have to investigate it. I haven't I haven't looked in, in detail on that. Um, there's always there's usually a plant solution for everything. Um, it, it may it may end up being that small one may not be feasible, but um, we can I think we 
like I said, there's usually a plant solution to, to everything for all conditions, especially in this climate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Marilyn, did you, uh, did you want to speak? I will, but I, I'll speak last. Uh, if, okay. Uh, then I'll, I'll jump in and I'll come back to you. If all that's right. The case. Um, so just on that last point too, I'm afraid I have to agree with the owner. Um, downtown Parksville is not without its problems. And, uh, and you could take very nice development like this that could become a really big problem if the access wasn't controlled in some way. Um, I did have a point noted about access from the Jensen right of way. And I just wondered since there's, uh, um, there's gonna be a fence along there, perhaps there could be a gate that was, that was specific hours, for example, when uh, you know, the retail or the restaurant was actually open and the gate would lock after that, uh, it's just a thought. Um, it would be kind of nice if you're walking along there to say, oh, a coffee shop, let's pop in for a coffee. And then you have to walk all the way around to the inside to get to it. So, but I, I could very easily see where control is required and, and a fence is required being in downtown Parksville. That's just the reality of it. Um, a comment on the overall development, uh, really nice looking building, really good articulation, which is something we're supposed to look for in this um, development area, not a bunch of flat planes. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, variance on the outside, uh, different materials. And uh, I, uh, I like the form of the building. So overall, uh, my compliments uh, on the building itself, I think it would be a very positive development in downtown Parksville. Um, the, uh, the building's really close to, to services. So um, you've got three food stores within a stone's throw of, of living there. And I can see where and some additional density um, it's probably quite desirable here. The existing height um, for this particular zoning, if you put commercial on the main floor, you can't even put a roof on the third floor. So if you have commercial on the, the main, no wonder they're having to go over this. This is a fairly low, in my opinion, <laughs> a fairly low allowance for a building in this area. And I think to get some density, which is very desirable for residential developments in Parksville right now, there's um, everything sells in, in it seems like days around here. Um, I can appreciate why the density is required. So um, I was a little concerned when I saw how much of a variance it was. Uh, but personally, I, I have to say I like the rooftop decks. I've been involved in many projects myself that have them. And they're a huge sales feature. And the people who get them love them. So um, I, uh, I think in this particular case, I... Uh, I, I would probably go along with retaining those decks. So the, um, uh, the idea of more wood siding that I heard earlier, I think that's a, a totally an architectural concern. Um, I think it's a nice looking building. Maybe some more wood would, would be nice, but I'm kind of uh, split on that one. Um, the location of the restaurant, I'm not too sure we should even be delving into that because we don't know that it would be a restaurant. And um, I think that that if you've got two spaces, one might be a restaurant and one might be a retail store, the retail store is going to want frontage because people drive by and they, they recognize there's some kind of uh, sale of goods going on there. Restaurants live more on their reputation and people know they may have to drive to the back to get one, uh, get to one. And um, I think actually a little seclusion in that case uh, onto a green space next to it is kind of nice. Uh, and I had a question, like part of the... Um, of this area is concerned with screening parking from, from the road. And uh, of course there's a driveway entrance and there's not an awful lot to, uh, to screen after that, but there's um looks to be like a hydro kiosk in one corner. And then there's some planting um, next to one of the stalls on the, I guess that would be the uh, south side of the property. Um, I looked on the elevations and those look like kind of low hedges. Um, and I wondered if they were tall enough to screen the cars. So I put that question to you, Kara, like what is that uh, planting around there and will they grow high enough to actually kind of screen the parking? They will eventually. <laughs> Landscape is never <laughs> instant gratification, obviously, but it's, they're, you're, yep. they're you hedges. So they can, be kept at, they can be kept at any height, definitely above the height of a, of a standard car vehicle. Okay, sure. okay. Yeah. That's yeah, what 100%. I kind of thought you should be. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, and I think, to be honest with you, that, that's all I had too. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know if we're um, causing a precedent by um, allowing the, the variants to proceed in this area, but I had to assume that if council were concerned about it, um, that would have been the sticking point uh, before it ever got to us. So I, I, I do tend to think that in this case, the, uh, the density warrants the extra height. So that's my opinion. Um, Can I just note, Tony, that there is a separate development variance permit process that will have public input put as a part of it that goes along with this, just, just for your reference. So yeah, there will be some, uh, some input yeah. that way. I mean, the, uh, a good part of the height is the access is to the, uh, the upper decks, but they're set way back on the roof. And I don't know that they'd be visible unless you were quite a ways back from the building. Um, so um, anyway, just my two bits was there. Um, Marilyn, we can go to you now, if you will. Oh, thanks, Tony. Uh, just so you know, it hasn't come to council. So okay. it, it comes to council after it comes to the ADP. I, I just had a couple of questions. I think it's a, a lovely building. Reminds me a bit of Berwick as well. Ties in nicely with Berwick. Um, can't speak to the height, so I'm not going. I'm not going down that road at all. Uh, I just had a couple of questions about the chargers. Uh, the whether or not you consider uh, putting some kind of e-bike charger with all the electric bikes. Um, having just bought one myself, kind of nice to um, to have a a, a way of charging your battery uh, for that, and then whether with the um, whether you'd put an EV charger for the visitors as well. Um, just just a thought. Just glad you have so many EV chargers. But it, the other thing that I wondered about is where are you getting the water for the rain garden roof gardens? Have you thought of any kind of rain catchment, even just for the roof gardens? being that water is such a precious commodity in Parksville and such a big issue for us right now. Um, that's, that's the one thing that I think is missing is some sort of rainwater capture. I know you've done a great job with the, the storm water capture, but how about water? So those are just my, my comments. Do you want to talk about the EV stuff, Bill? Sure. Yep. Yeah. I can mention that on the main level, there's a bike and scooter storage area to the to the east side of the amenity building. And much to like our building on Dogwood that we did, we're gonna have plug-ins there. So if you do roll in with a bicycle, that's a charger. At their bike stations, there will be a charging capability. And of course, a place to lock up your bike as well as several scooter parking stalls because we've had those uh, installed as well. And, and you are correct, Marilyn, they're very popular. Everybody plugs their bikes and their scooters in, in, the, in those areas, hence the ground level so that you don't have to haul it up an elevator or put it in your storage room downstairs. Um, as you can see, another concern that was raised in a few of our buildings was they everybody wanted a storage locker somewhere. Um, so we, we, we managed to find a space downstairs for that as well. So that, that should give people the, the option to plug their bikes in uh, and charge them or their scooters if, if that's what they're using. William, can I ask you as well, uh, or Bill, um, what about the guests? What about people coming to? Yeah, yeah, that's that's something we have actually researched. I know uh, in a couple of jobs we've done, uh, not myself, Bill, but been a part of in, in Kelowna, um, we ended up adding two um, for uh, ride share program cars and um, one of them got vandalized right away. Why, I don't know. And, and then there's the option of what type do you put in? Because most of these cars now are using different plugins. So if yeah. you go to a mall and they can give you 10 plugins, you usually see five Tesla, a couple of Chevy, and, a, you know, and the Toyota ones are different again. So that's the hard part about putting two in. What brand do you put in? So um, you look more for a service station or a larger mall where they can afford to put a selection of five, 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 rather than pick two and then everybody say, why don't you have a Chevy one? You got a Tesla one, right? So that that's the hard part of choosing what couple to put in. Um, right. Of that, that's why downstairs being a third, and hopefully during pre-sales or sales, you have the option to decide of which one to put in for that customer because they run around twenty five hundred dollars depending on what car type. And if it's a rapid charger, that you know the slow chargers, which nobody wants no more, they're getting cheaper. But you know people don't want to charge a car for twelve hours; they want two hours and go. So. Yeah, thanks. Okay. 
And um, just speaking to the green, the water retention, I, I, we can definitely uh, work with mechan uh, with probably mechanical, I guess, for to figure out if we can get some of that rainwater, some of the rainwater leaders to um, empty into those uh, green roof areas, and see if we can we can use that as a, as a water source. Unfortunately, I mean, it, it, I think the intent is that it'd be extensive green roof. It, it, may, it may have some grasses that you know blow in the wind to, to provide some interest, but it's not going to be either, it's going to be probably succulents and sedums that are going to be almost no water use on their own. No. Um, but there may be a, maybe some opportunity for storage up there and we can definitely work with mechanical to see if that if that's possible. Also, what about just rainwater catchment anyway for all the irrigation or is that, that's just, I know no one wants to put it in, it's too expensive and, but. It's not really the, ex well, the expense, of course, because you would need the amount um, you would need. I think I calculated for one site uh, for irrigation. It was a quite, it was a bigger site, but it was for a senior's facility. And we calculated that we, to store water for irrigation for the summer, we need to store a million gallons of water. Um, that's just, we're just not there yet with rainwater capture. Um, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks, Kara, for explaining. Actually, I missed one question, if I could toss it in, and I don't know how related to the development is, but just as a resident, i uh, always seen that space next to this called Jensen right-of-way. I just wondered, is there really ever any potential for that to become a street? Does I believe there's a, I believe there's a road closure going on right now at the city. Uh, maybe Sarah can speak to that. I'm Sarah. The details of what the future plans is for that area. I think, I think, are you talking, sorry, Tony, are you talking about the piece across Bagshaw to the east? Yes. Yeah, so um, on council's agenda on Monday, there there was a road closure applications. I, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I believe they are thinking about closing that, or maybe it's the alleyway between Eat Fresh that they're closing. Well, I guess in this case, you know, if you look at Bagshaw to the west, uh, that would put cars, I guess, you know, um, next to the green space, you'd still have some uh, uh, some separation there. But uh, no, I just wondered if the road would ever come through or would it be fairly close to this new building? Um, but, and I appreciate that's not a, a question that we're dealing with. It was just pure curiosity. Well, for some clarity, it is still a road. Uh, so it's still designated TR1. So it's not actually yeah. a park. So there is the option for the city to go to make this a road again in the future. Okay. Okay, well, I guess we've been around the table. So now we're kind of into the uh, discussion and recommendation part of this. Uh, there's been a number of issues that have come up. Um, Before we do the recommendations, did you maybe want to go around again, just in case anyone else had any other comments? Sure. Let's open it up if anybody remembered something they forgot the first time around. Can I say something? Hello? Yeah, who is that? Sorry. <laughs> it's me. Ian. Ian. Um, I, I was, I'm still looking at that space under the building. I'm sorry to go on about this, but um, I wonder if you can pull that back up on the floor plan. The, yes, that one. Um, I just looked at it and thought the, the entryway, the driveway to get to those four spaces can accommodate three cars, three car spaces. So the net loss, if you didn't have any, would only be two car spaces. And then you'd have that entire space unpaved or however you wanted to treat it um, as, a, as an amenity space instead of the space for cars, because that's a lot of paving. Did you, did you understand what I was saying? Yes, uh, the stalls would end up in here. Um, yeah. We are we are also utilizing this as an opportunity for uh, loading and garbage pickup to, to do the, to do their turnaround. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But 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 perhaps perhaps there's a way that we could um, depress some parking back this way, so that there is an opportunity for people to easily navigate in and out of the um, the parking area on the surface level. Sure. Yeah. I, it's just it's just a thought. That's all. Yep. Yep. Apart from that. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I, I think I think what, what what it'll come down to possibly in is um, depending on who 
um, where the interest is in yeah. the occupancy of that CRU will probably um, would probably determine the fate of that uh, of that space underneath there, along with you know a, a sort of a healthy discussion with the developer, obviously. But um, you know it may be a case that this somebody would come into that um, CRU space at the back and say, hey, is there any opportunity for us to quadruple the size of our outside patio amenity, in which case, um, you know, we could probably start looking into ways to um, adapt that ground plan to, uh, to accommodate something like that, which, which I think is what you're sort of alluding to. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a, if there was an amenity connection between the two CRU spaces and the gym amenity and the entry to the residential that all was sort of somewhat interconnected as opposed to um, broken up by the uh, the car stalls here. I mean, maybe 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 there's a, a, a sort of a, a happy medium somewhere where um, uh, you know when they're not being used, they can be uh, appropriated as other spaces. Um, you know, it's like always looking for ways to make the ground plan a, a mutable, changeable, uh, multi-use surface. Um, so maybe it's uh, you know maybe maybe that's something that we would need to um, have a have a think about. I don't certainly want to put words into Bill's mouth, but uh, but we're uh, you know I, I certainly understand your sentiment around the uh, the ground plane between the uh, the residential entryway and that uh, and that commercial space. So. Hey, uh, do you mind if I? When you look at the overall um, site plan, there, there's precious little space for any human beings to loiter or hang around or do anything, just sit around. Most of it's devoted to hard paving for land, for um, cars, and the rest of it is very, very dense landscaping, which you don't really get a chance to go into. Um, so it, it's, it's just a comment generally on the use of the ground plane. Apart from that, I really appreciate the effort and I like that open space and I like the way that the buildings are articulated and I'm all in favor of the height, um, what you call it, variance, because I think that whole general area of Parksville needs to be a higher density. And to put up a building like this, um, I think we need to be catering or putting the additional density in there where it really counts. So. I'm very much in favor of the additional height variance for that. Yeah, and it's Nigel here, sir. I've lost my video. I'm just going to throw a solution out um, to everybody and see what everybody thinks just while we're talking and while we have the opportunity to discuss it with the panel. So my understanding is these four stalls are beyond what's required in the zoning bylaw and therefore not specifically required by regulation, right? So. I think it would behoove all of us to leave this with some flexibility for the space under the building. So I'd like to dash this in, Glenn, on mm -hmm. your plan and have it called flex space so that in the fantastical opportunity that this becomes a brew pub and a, a distillery on either side, they're going to want to <laughs> use that entire space. Yeah, and okay. uh, you and I will be very happy people. And I think to include that and embed that in our development permit would probably benefit everyone interested. So I'm just going to throw that out there and see what people think about that. Yeah, I think that's well, you certainly know the way to my heart, Nigel. So uh... <laughs> uh, I think that's, that's a good uh, temporary solution. That way you don't have to come back and amend the DP. It's just left open and flexible within the document registered on title. I would okay. support that for sure. So we'll probably make that one of our first recommendations is just to fill that as a flex space. But, uh, did anybody else uh, have additional comments? I was just going to say something, Tony. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, uh, in my dream list of trying to do a downtown revite, which I've been pushing for. We had a workshop. We're going to have another workshop with the uh, PDBA and the chamber. Um, I'd really like to see us give 19A a road diet in the downtown core. 
Um, so that would provide some more parking when we do that. Just throwing it out there. Whether that happens or not, that's on my wish list. I think it's a really doable thing. So um, just something maybe to keep in mind as, as we think about how we're going to get around the downtown, trying to make it more walkable and cycling, friend, cycling friendly. So this building fits in really nicely with that concept. So I just thought I'd throw it out there for everyone. I believe we, I believe we have some plans laying around the office that already illustrate that from eons ago. <laughs> yeah, but, but we're not talking about a, a, a racetrack around Jensen. I'm talking about no. something else. No, even before that, uh, I think uh, yeah. Lanark, Lanark Consultants may have prepared something back in OT5. Yeah. yeah, and I did another presentation for council in my workshop. So, yeah, lots of good ideas that can come out of this. So hopefully, hopefully it'll all work out. Okay, um, so I guess we are into the recommendation uh, phase and, and if it's okay, I've just noted item one as being uh, possible flex space under the building in lieu of four non-required stalls. Um, sounded like it got pretty good reception from everybody. Uh, as far as which part of the uh, permit area three uh, that affects, maybe Sarah can help me there. <laughs> It's not really landscaping. Uh, Sorry, question, Tony? Well, the question would be if we did uh, go along with, with Glenn's suggestion as a recommendation that we would have a flex space where the four stalls are non-required. Just mm -hmm. wondering what, what uh, guideline we use as the, uh, the point we're addressing. Yeah, I don't think we have a specific guideline to that, um, but you could for sure comment on it. Yep. Okay. Well, that was the first one I had. Um, maybe I'll just go over uh, um, some of the things we talked about. Uh, how does the uh, the panel feel about access versus not access from the right of way? So Tony, that, that might be a bit of a conversation too with engineering. Um, so if there's a, there'd have to be a conversation with the engineering departments about whether the city would facilitate access through the greenway to that private property. Um, okay. and I'm, not, I'm not sure um, right now how that would work. So um, we'd just be looking at things on site. So you could maybe suggest that if there's an opportunity to have access, that you would recommend having a gate or, or something like that. Um, but as far as the actual access and the agreements through engineering, that's something that I'm not too sure what how that process would go. So we would just say, um, if an access from the right of way is possible, perhaps we would recommend uh, a gated restricted access to the property. Yeah, you can do that for sure. Yeah. Um, might as well tackle the big one that was uh, actually probably part of the reason it was sent to us too. Does, does everybody or not everybody um, agree that the, the variance is supported? Is there anybody who's... Um, is not in favor of that. I'm in favor of it, but I would, before approving it, I'd like to see some sight lines from the upper levels, perhaps the balcony, perhaps the roof, a sight line from those points to the closest uh, residential units. And it's more from a point of view of uh, privacy issues for the existing residents, just to feel comfortable with that, that height. Mm -hmm. so, I'm not familiar with the area, so I'm not sure what those residential units, how close they are and what, they, what they're like. So you're just doing a, a sight line study, basically. That, that's correct. I think the only ones that are really impacted are the ones to the south, and they're mostly screened by by the right of way. So uh, I just wonder. Mm -hmm. Right of way and trees. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a there's a nine and a half foot hedge there in front of their building. You can't you can't even see the roof line. Okay. They have a large head that's they basically they have about twelve. That's one of the things we looked at when we walked the property is that their hedge is so high on the walkway side, you, you they they don't get any daylight. Yeah. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Quite a number of large mm -hmm. trees along that right away by the looks of it yeah. too. So that's the that's the edge condition. That's the hedge. That's the roof line. Um, it's mm -hmm. only a couple of feet. There's there's not a lot of space between. And that's an old picture. It looks like. Yeah, and that's that that hedge is right here, and that's this is the face of the building. So there's very little patio space on that side. Mm -hmm. And then if we jump back to, this is a you know a sort of seagull view of this deck. So people sitting on this deck or standing on this deck or the sight line is, is I'm almost a hundred percent certain that the sight line will be cut off by the, uh, the, uh, the perimeter yeah. um, edge of the roof. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think these guys um, sitting up here are, are, you know, there's going to be a fairly negative impact on any privacy to this existing building. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what's going to happen on this side in the future. So, but again, you can see from this diagram that the the limitation of where you're standing to where the edge of the building is is, you know, creates quite a significant um, shield for those uh, those neighboring properties. Um, and, and and in defense of these actually being highly livable, enjoyable rooftop spaces. These ones on the north side are uh, are held back, so that when you're sitting here, you're looking at across the roof of your own home, mm -hmm. and not necessarily looking into the loading bays of thrifty. So yeah. So you know, I, I mean, I would maybe I would maybe challenge is is does this provide enough of a, a response to that, or um, do you what are your thoughts? I, there? I, I think so. There's the uh... There's probably more of an issue from the the top level balcony rather than the roof, but yeah, I think it's okay. From what I've seen on that edging on the trees there. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, you know the level four of the building is also within uh, the, the height variance. It's within. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, Glenn, maybe just since it's going back to council anyway, for the sake of a drawing, if you did do a couple of sight lines, uh, uh, you know, just very geometric single line kind of things, just to illustrate that it wasn't a problem, it might not be a bad thing. Yeah, I think it would be useful just for the council to see that there, there wouldn't be a problem. And Nigel here, I think uh, if that's what the council or the panel would like, we can provide a section drawing showing that sight line ahead of this being distributed through the DVP process, which is to occur as a part of this DP. And that way the public would see that section as well. I think it'd be a good idea, Nigel. You know, just sort of heads off a potential problem too. Okay. Um, so I, I guess we can, uh, we can at this point then say that uh, the design panel is, is fine with the variance if I don't hear anything else. Okay, um, let me see. There was um, some indication that we wanted uh, a larger canopy and more front entrance identification. Was the, uh, the panel generally in favor of that as a recommendation? Yes. I think that's a good recommendation as well. Just, uh, and it sounds like it's gonna be addressed from what Bill was saying anyway, with signage as well, but um, we are looking at uh, sort of uh, weather protection for entrances as being one of the criteria we should uh, give some thought to. So um, if the panel is okay to make that recommendation, I guess uh, you know, more canopy and better identification at the front entrance. That would be, I think, architectural design of character 1D, if I'm not mistaken. So, um... Currently in the diagram here, this overhang from the front door to the face of this building, it may not be well represented right here, but that's close to a 12 foot overhang from the front door. Um, okay, I sure didn't, didn't see that much, so uh, that's considerable. <laughs> sorry, just one thing. I'll just say that's a considerable overhang. Cla yeah, Claire's just, just going to speak to it for one second. So if you look at uh, where those planters are in front of the front door there for the residential, all the way out to the sidewalk is covered space. So those parking stalls are nine feet deep 
a standard stall. So you're looking at, I think it's about 11 feet deep. I can give you an exact dimension if you'd like, um, but you're getting a fully covered area um, as you tour around those columns. So this, the, all of those stalls from six to 19 are fully covered. Um, and there's the lighting that sort of directs you into this space. Uh, there'll be linear lighting along stalls 14 to 19 and then in that flex space area. And so that's, and then as you're walking towards uh, where it says stall 14, there's a feature um, finish and that's where the signage would be. And then tucked away is, is the residences and they're looking more into the animation of that rear CRU space. So we, we do have a fully um, and healthily covered front entrance, as well as very well covered entrances to each of the, uh, the CRU spaces as well. Lots of rain coverage. So but I think I'm even, since you raised that point, maybe uh, uh, Tony is maybe sort of exemplifying the uh, sort of carry on. You're breaking up, Glenn. So I think, you know, given the fact that we have um, rain covering out at this line or uh, that's the overhang of the building above then um, i think it's about i think what we're what um, i think panel is looking for is ways to um, identify a stronger entry um, delineation for the residential that's definitely one of the points for sure yeah Okay, yeah, I, I don't know if we can create more of a weather covered entryway. Sorry to just bust, bust in here, but Ian, you were the one who maybe uh, made that reference according to my notes. Are you happy with the amount of cover there? Well, they, they, it wasn't, it wasn't actually, the issue wasn't coverage for the, the weather in terms of weather. I think that was adequately handled and, you know, that's, really great coverage, but it was just that the way that the front entry area, when you look at the entire building, that it does not signify very strongly where you get into the building. I mean, the only clue that you have is if you happen to see the signage on there. So I was just, it was just a general comment about you know, it's an opportunity to maybe change the way that the fascia appears on the building. And these are, these are only suggestions, um, but it is, it's, I, I don't think it's to do with uh, weather protection at all. I think it's to do with, well, with wayfinding and the general uh, addressing of how you get into the building or what's important on the building. It's just, it's not just another space. It's a very important part of the building. I mean, we have the same treatment just about everywhere else on the building. So um, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to, to do something that might enhance the way you enter the space. Or at least you, you, you the signal. Yep. Okay, well, maybe a design panel will, will make the comment that uh, to explore opportunities for stronger entrance identification and uh, we'll leave that in the hands of the architect. Sure. Um, we had uh, a recommendation to look into uh, rainwater collection. I think we should probably just say to explore opportunities for that with uh, all of the roof area landscaping. Does that sound reasonable, folks? Yes. Okay, and that would be, I think, 7A if we're using the, the guide. And uh, there was a, a thought for a, perhaps an electric bike charger uh, from, from Maryland, which seemed like a, a reasonable idea. Um, if there's more than one type of that, I'm not too sure how to answer that question, but uh, uh, if it's just a, a regular, um, regular you know, 110 yeah. volt uh, outlet, that would be... Uh, Pretty easy to do, I guess. Sorry, Tony Nigel here. I believe that is accommodated in that secure storage area for the e-bikes. There are plugins there. Okay, yeah. so that's taken care of. Um, folks, I think that's all I made notes of. Um, there was some 
thought about whether or not you know we would recommend um, the rooftop gardens from from Ivan. Um, was there any consensus on that? I think it's a very nice uh, uh, point for the full building, and I, I I think we should. I don't see any reason why we should get rid of them. Um, it's a it's a very very good selling feature for the units. Yep. Um, so I, if you're putting that kind of building up and it's pretty big, it's going to dramatically change the entire block. Um, there isn't any reason why you shouldn't have something special, you know, um, that enhances the use of that flat plane on the top. So I'm in, I'm in favor of, of those spaces. Maybe there could be a little bit more landscaping or a softer area on the top, but um, generally speaking, I, I think I think it's fine. It's a good gesture for the for those units. Yeah, and I already said I agree with you on that one. So, anybody else have a point to make on that one? And anything that I missed at all that, uh, that we might want to accommodate in the recommendations. Wasn't any any clear idea of how you get to the mechanical equipment? I, I'm curious. Glenn, if you're still there, maybe you could answer that one. Or Nigel. Access to the rooftop mechanical? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we would probably be um, expanding the uh, staircase or the over using the uh, overrun area of the elevator to access the rooftop and then uh, and then uh, make your way over to the um, the screened uh, mechanical units. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's the way. I just didn't want you to forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so coming from stairwells and then access to there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, typically uh, we would provide a, if it was a, an asphalt roof, we would, um, we'd be able to provide uh, some uh, walking surface sitting on pedestals that would protect the uh, membrane and still allow maintenance um, access to the, uh, to the centralized mechanical uh, screened area. Somebody's going to be up there blowing leaves off the roof anyway. I used to do that when I was a teenager in Victoria. <laughs> Show that leaves would get on this high roof. <laughs> One question that I have um, is just the general resolution tone. Um, so my my understanding is that it's a DP with variance. Um, so are you would the panel like to accept it as presented, um, request additional information, or have it reconsidered by the panel? You know, I, I, uh, I guess our sight lines are additional information, but that'll be done before it gets to council by the sounds of it. Mm -hmm. um, we, everything else that we've done is kind of um, suggestions, I think, rather than, so, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, people, but I, I think we're, we're advising that we accept it. Uh, and we just have select notations rather than uh, bring us more information kind of resolution here. Okay, so I'm just looking at the sample resolutions that I have printed here. Um, yep. There's one for a DP with variance request for additional information. Um, so basically for that one, you would be accepting the application in principle um, with the support for the variance requested and the applicant would revisit the items that you've identified. Um, so we'd submit that information to staff and we would review it and then take it forward to council to consider. That sounds like we, what we want okay. to me, yeah. And I saw basically in the end, Sarah, five points. One was the flex space under the building. Uh, number two was if it's possible to have right of way access to position a gate or a restricted access. Number three is uh, prepare sight lines for the height variance, which we otherwise are in favor of. A stronger identification at the front entrance and explore rainwater retention possibilities. That would be our five points. Okay, perfect. Um, so we 
Do they need to vote on that one year or have a mover and seconder? Um, Ian yeah, is going to move it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we'll need a mover and a seconder for the recommendations, Tony. Okay, Ian has moved and Bob has seconded. And mover and seconder to adjourn. Okay. And then we just need a mover and a seconder to adjourn. I move. Is that Ivan? Yeah. Okay. Just one last thing. Thanks very much for the presentation, people. Uh, very thorough, uh, very nice project. Um, I can speak for everybody. Really nice to see an exciting redevelopment of the downtown in Parksville. It really works for me that you're doing mm -hmm. this. Thank you all for your time and service to the community. We really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. See you next time, people. Cheers. Hopefully in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.